Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Best Practices for a Gap-Free LVT LVP Installation. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are muted. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen, and we'll answer them at the end of today's session, time permitting, or via email after. And you can always send questions to MaPay Digital at mapay.com. We also invite you to visit the floor covering and installation systems page on our website, www.mapay.com, where we have videos, projects, downloads, and more about adhesives and resilient flooring solutions. It's a lot of information, and it all happens to be overseen by today's speaker, the business manager for MaPay's floor covering and installation systems product line. Jeff Johnson. Jeff brings to the industry more than 35 years experience in the development and marketing of floor covering installation products. His practical experience in the construction industry and as a bench chemist give him an insightful perspective on surface preparation, moisture mitigation, and floor covering installation. Today, he's going to share information about adhesives and installing luxury vinyl tile. So, without further delay, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for spending some time with me today, this afternoon, and this morning, depending on what time zone you are, learning about uh, that favorite friend of ours, the LVT uh, flooring product, and some techniques and best practices that can help make this a, a flawless installation. Um, I will admit that some of this information I'll be presenting to you uh, today is, is included in some of my previous uh, webinars on this topic, but I think it's really worth repeating. It's important that we understand an awful lot about this flooring material so that we, when we install it, uh, we know what to expect. The last thing any of us want to have as a surprise on the job site. So having said that, here we go and we'll dive into the material. Um, our objectives for the next 45 minutes to an hour is to learn about the physical makeup and dimensional stability of this luxury vinyl plank product that we all uh, know and love. We're going to understand and learn about the environmental influences that can affect <clears throat> the dimensional stability of the LVT and B. It's, uh, it is not something that is not affected by the environment, believe it or not. We'll have to make sure we're clear on that. Then we'll take a look at the myriad of choices that MAPE offers for bonding this material to substrates and give you some working knowledge as to the differences between them, why you would want to pick one over the other, uh, and then lastly, some methods and recommendations that will help ensure that you get a, a gap-free LVT installation, which is what we're all trying to, to achieve here in this, in this world. Uh, and believe me, I, from all the LVT installations I have seen, this is probably one of the biggest issues of the product itself, is to make sure that there are no gaps in the, in the, in the installation. So hopefully by the end of this uh, webinar, you'll have some new ideas. You may have some arguments with me. Uh, that's all good. I love uh, productive conversation on stuff, but uh, by all means, uh, let's get into the material. And if you do have questions, uh, please uh, save them towards the end of the presentation. And the Jen will moderate a question and answer uh, period for a while. I believe you can put those questions in the chat box uh, on the screen and uh, we'll address them. If we run out of time, uh, we'll make sure we get a copy of those uh, questions to me later and I will do my best to reply back to them as soon as I can. Okay. So we start off with a little bit of knowledge about luxury vinyl tile or plank, which we're all kind of talking about, mostly plank in the commercial world. Uh, the tile products, the square materials are still out there, but most of our business seems to be in the plank versions. And what they are are a, a laminated structure of various layers of material uh, providing unique performance and visual attributes. Uh, it starts off with a plastic base layer, uh, which is primarily PVC, 
a lot of times that includes a lot of post-consumer regrind or whatever they can get to make that the least expensive aspect of the business. Um, a middle layer of some form, again, for more dimensional stability and, and weight and, fill, and build, followed by a wear layer, uh, excuse me, a, a film, a, a decorated film. Uh, and a lot of times this is a digitally printed paper stock or vinyl stock that looks like wood or ceramic tile or stone or granite or you name it, the visuals are endless in this product category, followed by a wear layer, uh, which is uh, typically a uh, cross-link polyurethane material that provides the body, the texture, the glassy appearance that goes on top of the printed decoration, protects it from scratches and damage, and then a lot of times followed by a top coat, or, which is usually a UV cure acrylic or another urethane coating, again, for gloss uh, from mats, gloss to semi-gloss to gloss looking materials, and also to provide the wear resistance necessary to keep this product on the floor without scratching and nicking the decoration. Okay, so what kind of environmental factors affect the dimensional stability of that LVT? We spend an awful lot of time in other uh, wood categories of flooring, for example, the wood floor market, talking about things that affect the dimensional stability of wood. Uh, in that particular case, we talk a lot about the relative humidity of the environment, the ambient humidity, the, the water moisture content of the wood itself. Um, we talk an awful lot about in that space of flooring types to make sure you acclimate that wood flooring prior to installation. And the reason why that we harp on that or talk about that extensively is because it does change the material considerably with increases or decreases in humidity. Um, LVT has similar issues uh, with dimensional stability, not necessarily related to humidity like we would see in wood, but mostly uh, it's impact by temperature, changes in temperature, um, and somewhat by humidity and moisture and somewhat by plasticizer migration or exodus which we'll talk about, but these are the kinds of things that are environmental influences that can affect the dimensional stability of the product we're trying to install. So like the wood flooring market, we want you to control the, the acclimatization, acclimatization, is that a word? The, yes, of the flooring product to match where you're installing it. In the LVT world, we'd like for you to make sure you're acclimating it to the temperature that's supposed to be installed. We'll get more into that in, as we move on to the slides. The main culprit, the biggest driver in changing the shape, if you will, of a luxury vinyl tile product is temperature. Um, you've got to keep in mind that LVT is basically a piece of plastic, obviously with manufacturing variations and layers and fiberglass reinforcement and different this and different that, but it's still a piece of plastic. And plastic uh, is impacted by um, temperature. Changes in temperature will cause it to either grow in shape or shrink in shape. And this is what's called thermal expansion. And, you know, it's not something, <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, as a construction guy or contractor guy, you're not really thinking so much about the, the impacts of thermal expansion. I can tell you on the other side of the fence that structural engineers who are building buildings and putting plate glass windows and uh, big giant slabs of concrete think about thermal expansion constantly because they know full and well that certain things, certain materials have uh, what's called a coefficient of thermal expansion into them. And as the temperature changes, those materials will grow in shape, shrink in shape, et cetera, curl, whatever the name is, um, but they will be changed. So they have to design that knowledge into their building. Uh, that's why we have expansion joints and concrete slabs to be able to accommodate changes in temperature so that it isn't smash into each other like tectonic plates and create earthquakes and all that kind of stuff. But um, that's, uh, that's a big deal for us. You know, where do these sources of temperature change come from? 
um, obvious stuff that we have to deal with as contractors in this world. We have to deal with the fact that many times when we're on a project, uh, the building owner or the general contractor, or even when, as far as the construction project is involved, the HVA systems may not be on, uh, and you have to install in an unacclimated environment. Um, this is uh, an important thing to note because it will have some impact on the overall performance of the, of the flooring itself. You know, flooring installed at temperatures different than the operating temperatures, and again, as I mentioned before, if you're installing flooring at 90 degrees out when the, there's no HV AC systems are on and it's a, a hot room and you're installing hot LVT and then it all looks good when you uh, do the job, but then the temperature gets turned down to 72 because the building owner comes back in, the operations we go back in operation and things cool down. Things are going to happen to that floor. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Exposure to UV. Uh, UV in this particular case is not getting a sunburn, but it is the UV radiation that is absorbed into the color of the pigments of the LVT, warming it up. Uh, so that is something that you have to be concerned about. I think at one point uh, I wrote into one of the technical data sheets for one of our products, do not install in areas where of direct sunlight. People were wondering whether I created a vampire type uh, floor covering adhesive, which is not the case, but it was really more of a, a warning to the installer group to make sure you're paying attention to areas of installation where it's going to get direct sunlight, increase the flooring temperature and as a consequence, change the whole performance of the system. And you can wind up with some problems with that as well. Uh, and also radiant heat systems, on the in-floor heating system, whether they be electronic or hydronic, uh, these things add heat to the substrate. And obviously when you add heat to them, that PVC material is going to change its shape. It's just inevitable at some point. Whether well, things can change the shape of it, uh, moisture and alkalinity, uh, maybe not so much moisture, uh, particularly, but the alkalinity that comes with it can do some significant damage to uh, an LVT installation, changing its shape. Um, oftentimes, that high alkalinity is going to first impact the adhesive that's involved underneath the floor. Um, when the adhesive is affected, the whole installation becomes effective. Uh, the alkalinity can actually burn some of the back of the of the LVT and leach out some of the plasticizers that are in, in involved in that making of that material. And when that plasticizer leaves, the material shrinks and you wind up with things that look like this picture you see on the right, the cupping and doming of the LVT. It will change some shape. That plasticizer loss is something that uh, probably not a huge issue but something that you need to be aware of but plasticizers used in the making of these products are fugital they're motile they they are in the chemistry world we call them non evaporative solvents basically they're something that stays in the system and helps soften the resins and provide that resilient characteristics to them but they are still a solvent and then with changes in temperature and alkaline and cleaning materials can that can leach out. If you remember some of the vinyl dashes we used to have in our cars, um, which were notorious for cracking, like you see a picture on the right, you'll also remember there was kind of an opalescent haze on the inside of the windshield above that crack or inside the windshield and you had to wipe it up and it would smear all over the place. But that's the plasticizer leaving the, the, the vinyl um, and because it got hot. The same thing can happen, um, excuse me, with plastic PVC flooring. And heat can cause that uh, plasticizer to evaporate. When that leaves the system, it can cause some shrinkage and become brittle and do all sorts of things that we don't really want it to do. So that's something to be a care about. So let's go back a little bit about this thermal expansion and make sure we understand a little bit about that. And you may be all saying to me, Jeff, this doesn't make sense that plastic is plastic. It's not going to change its shape. But the bottom line is that the science of this is that it's 
must change. The, the tendency of matter is it's going to change its shape, area, volume, density in response to the temperature. Um, that is very important for us to understand. And again, we've talked about you know, engineers, mechanical engineers that are working on the design of buildings have to understand what the thermal expansion is of certain materials and design that into the structure to accommodate that with changes in temperature. Uh, this coefficient of linear thermal expansion is the thing that we need to deal with with LVT. That's the changes in dimension, changes in length and shape of material um, has some impact. And again, I'll remind some of you if you're, if you're old enough or maybe not so old, we used to look at this in junior high school science where we would do the evaluation of thermal expansion of an aluminum tube or a brass tube or an iron tube. We ran hot water or steam through it and we would see what uh, the amount of growth was in that particular metal with a certain period of certain change in temperature. The same kind of test could have done with a piece of PVC pipe, uh, which is indicative of the same kind of material used to make LVT. Bottom line out of it, all of this stuff is important to remember that with changes in temperature, whether it's increasing or decreasing, these materials are going to change their shape. It's just a fact of life. Okay. This, uh, for example, this chart you're looking at here is a thermal expansion uh, impact. A uh, chart, this information is the kind of stuff that mechanical engineers have to look at when they look at building buildings or whatever. But uh, polyvinyl chloride here has a linear coefficient of expansion of 52 uh, compared to steel and aluminum is 23 and 12 and concrete's got 11. Uh, just, just those numbers themselves will give you some idea about the higher the number, the more it's going to grow, the more it's going to shrink to changes on uh, with changes of temperature. Uh, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which is the majority of the composition of the LVT we're doing today. Polyethylene and polypropylene are part of that PVC free family of uh, LVT. And you'll notice that the linear expansion on those particular products is higher than that of PVC. So something you really have to be paying attention to when you're using these non PVC flooring types, uh, they could potentially have a greater impact uh, with temperature in terms of its dimensional stability. So you take a look at this chart up on the right. If we start off with a piece of material that's 36 inches long and we change the temperature 20 degrees, there is a linear change based on that coefficient, linear coefficient of expansion number that says that that is going to grow 0 0.037 inches. So what was 36 inches before is now 36.04. Uh, that you may not think that that's a huge number, but if you have uh, two pieces of LVT that are beautifully placed together and they are super tight and they have no gaps between them and it's 70 degrees in your room and then all of a sudden the sun comes through the window and it warms that surface up to 20 degrees, that 0.04 inches has got to go somewhere. Where does it go? Uh, it's going to force it, it, it's just going to force itself together between the two pieces, and you'll wind up with that uh, infamous phenomenon we call peaking at the butt seams. Maybe not so much at the length or the long cuts or the 36 inches wide side of it, but certainly at the butt joints, you're going to wind up seeing. Uh, that kind of uh, growth. Now, if you look at polypropylene and polyethylene, those numbers are even greater. And I just want to give you a frame of reference that uh, a 1 16th inch gap is 0 0.0625 inches. I, it's hard for me to put that stuff in, uh, in, in fractional terms, but a 0 0.037 inch gap is a 32nd of an inch. And since I've got two pieces side by side, I wind up having two gaps combined or two expansions together, or I wind up expanding the whole thing 0 0.074, uh, which is a little bit more than a 16th of an inch. And just a frame of reference that that is about the gap or the thickness of a credit card. So let's just say that uh, we go the other direction 
if I install the floor covering at 90 degrees and it cools down, it's all beautiful, tight, perfect looking. You walk out the job and everybody's happy. The air conditioning comes on and it drops 20 degrees. Um, all this PVC material is going to shrink 0.03 or 0.074 inches or that 16th of an inch. And you're gonna wind up with 16th inch gaps uh, between each one of these planks. Now there's some influences that can help reduce that. Uh, or and we'll get into that when we talk about bonding solutions. But at the end of the day, the vinyl material is going to want to move. It's going to want to change its shape. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to not avoid the uh, anthropomorphism. It doesn't want. It's a fact of, of engineering and the fact of the performance of the material. It will put a stress on the system because it is shrinking or it is growing. So there is some strain being developed by changes of temperature. Very important to understand. And again, this is just some visual examples of what those gaps might look like. And again, they get worse with the changes of temperature. There's a swing of 30 degrees or 40 degrees. Uh, there are some big differences there associated with it. So why does LVT shrink in a controlled environment? Let's just say that it's in 72 degrees and it's always going to be 72 degrees. Why is the LVT still shrinking? Well, there are still some reasons for that. And a lot of it has to do, some of it has to do with how the product's made. Um, the, you know, the process of making vinyl flooring is a very uh, involved system of material, but you're putting an awful lot of shear on polyvinyl chloride resin, stretching it, pulling it, shaping it, smashing it, rolling it, and you're putting it under an awful lot of stress. Uh, that comes out of the machine and it's shaped and formed and it's hot and you typically try to cool it down in what's called an annealing process, run it through a water bath to chill it and kind of shrink it into a shape. It's kind of much like you would do with uh, your forging of your knife blades that you're working out in the backyard, making your own knives. The best way to get them stronger is to anneal them, shrink them, drop them in cold water or hot oil to get some shape onto them and to, to, to anneal them. Well, if you don't monitor the annealing temperature properly in the manufacturing process and it gets too warm, the water's too warm, or you skip that process, then the product has got some inherent strain into it as it comes out and gets put in a box. Um, but over time, that strain is gonna continue to work and will wind up changing the dimensional stability of the product. Again, plasticizer migration, uh, diffusion is another area. Um, whenever you start extracting stuff out of this vinyl flooring by using alkaline cleaning solutions or uh, exposing them to high temperatures and causing the plasticizer to evaporate, you know, you're allowing these things to lose a component of their structure and wind up shrinking in terms of shape. So that's all part of the deal. Now, these are a couple of examples of manufacturers uh, specification sheets for their LVT. The names are blotted out to protect the innocent, but it, it's pretty much true on everybody's. But there are standards um, authorized for shrinkage and stability and dimensional stability of LVT. So really what's important for you to know right off the, the bat is that the manufacturers, importers of these products fully know and understand that the product has some license to shrink on you or grow on you over time. Uh, and there is an ASTM standard business on that and an ISO standard as well. But the ASTM F2199 is the standard test method for determining dimensional stability and curling properties of resilient flooring after exposure to heat. And in that, heat is somewhat related to aging, related to uh, exposure to heat, for example but they're allowing for 0.1% machine direction and 0.2% cross machine direction shrinkage as allowable uh, levels of performance for LBT. So again, the standards exist to let you know that this stuff has a tendency to change its shape over time, due to temperatures, change in temperature uh, and other influences. And those can be some pretty significant uh, changes. So how do we, control all of this movement. Um, first and foremost, you can uh, 
obviously look for LVT constructions that are designed to be more dimensionally stable. Oftentimes the manufacturers will include a fiberglass reinforcement, some extra structural build that keeps that uh, inherent shrinkage a little bit more under control. Certainly, and most importantly, you can control the ambient and slab temperature before, during, and after the installation. Um, and I, I, it's in, <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, you, those of you who are in the contracting business installing floor covering, you really need to be doing this in ideal conditions. Uh, you need to be working in a 72 degree temperature room or at least installed in the operating environment where it's going to be uh, utilized. Avoid exposure to alkaline solutions or excess moisture. Control exposures to radiant heat, whether it be coming from sunlight or radiant heat systems. Uh, so those are some environmental factors that you can change. Um, the other solution is to help use some high modulus adhesive for bonding. And again, as I mentioned before, the LVT is going to shrink no matter what. If you drop the temperature 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 50 degrees, temperature swings, there's going to be an awful lot of strain put on that system. But if you can use higher modulus adhesives to bond that stuff to the floor, you may be able to overcome some of that movement. Uh, it's still going to put a lot of stress on the system, but should be able to control some of it. And we're trying to get to no movement, I mean, no gapping at all, um, but uh, it's unfortunately going to have to be a combination of a variety of different elements of, of environmental control and bonding solution checking. So let's kind of take a look now when we get into some best practices for LVT installation requirements. Let's take a look at the whole picture uh, of things that help ensure this um, and get into some more details as well. So the first a couple bullet points here. First of all, is to evaluate the substrate, um, make sure that it's proper flat, high compression strength, meets the requirements uh, for the flooring manufacturer. If there are anything that is out of spec there in terms of flatness, smoothness, moisture content, or etc., uh, you need to make sure you do your remediation to get that all under control. Temperature control is a must-have. Uh, for making sure you have a gap-free or um, the most pot, most potential gap-free insulation of LVT you can get. A bonding solution, uh, this is something that is important for AU to understand. And we at MFA have a variety of different options for that. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, but there are reasons why you would want to pick one over another. And it's all primarily based on the environment in which you're going to be installing. And maintaining the floor is also very important uh, of how you make sure that it's properly maintained over its time. So it's more than more than just installing it. It's um, it's how you communicate to the customer base how to take care of this after it's done. So again, subfloor preparation, moisture management. If the readings are coming back uh, higher than the adhesive system will take, uh, then we have all sorts of solutions which we won't go in. I'd ask you to talk to your MFA sales rep for that and he'll help you with figuring out the appropriate moisture mitigation system. And there are a variety of choices, uh, epoxy membranes, acrylic polymer membranes, polyurethane products, and some new ones that are um, tape systems that are available to help control moisture management as well. Uh, the floor needs to be flat. Um, the, this product category is called resilient for a reason. It does conform to the shapes of the flooring quite well. It is it's resilient, it's flexible. Um, so if your subfloor is not perfectly flat, it is going to show every wave and defect that's in there. So if your floor, it doesn't meet the flat requirements, the level requirements, smoothness requirements, then you're gonna to need to deal with that. Deep fill cement based patches, fast setting compounds, skim coatings, and ideally self leveling underlayments and primers for that. Again, self leveling underlayments make the flattest, levelest, application for LBT and we at MAPA are seeing a great deal more use of levelers in the marketplace uh, in association with LBT installations anyway. So uh, it's becoming a pretty good symbiotic relationship between the two. There are suitable substrates for this product. Again, concrete and self-based uh, cement-based patching compounds and leveling compounds are suitable. Uh, 
sorry, gypsum underlayments are suitable as long as they meet that ASTM F2419. Uh, again, keep in mind that gypsum products do take longer to dry and you do not want to put an impervious moisture barrier on top of that called vinyl flooring uh, without making sure that that uh, gypsum is properly cured. And then you've got uh, plywood materials as well, um, typically group one, CC, uh, marine grade, et cetera. Sorry, I'm going too fast. All right, so the limitations for concrete, it needs to be installed according to ASTM F710. I think that's now an 18, not version 13, and ACI 302, American Concrete Institute. Uh, by the way, if you don't have copies of these um, two documents, I would highly encourage you to get them. Uh, the ASTM F710, I think, will cost you 30 or $40 off their off the ASTM website definitely worth having. It's a very good document to have, and it's the basis for all resilient floor covering installation. A lot of great terminology in there. And I would also recommend the ACI, which stands for American Concrete Institute 302.2, which is a, another great document for the installation of moisture sensitive floor covering. And a lot of great concrete education in there. Uh, a lot of good information for you in terms of all of that. Let's talk about compressive strength, flatness, surface pH, moisture content, all that is in there. And again, basic guidelines for vinyl flooring is it's got to be greater than 3,000 psi, 3 sixteenths of 10, pH range is 9 to 11. And again, we need to make sure this concrete is aged properly and gone through its carbonization process and it's not super hot, uh, which what I mean by that is a high pH which can cause problems, and then the moisture emissions need to be measured. Now, these numbers I showed you on the right are um, <laughs> have been blown well past uh, with adhesive developments of recent years, uh, but those are some of the numbers that still stick in the minds of people of three pounds and 75%. Uh, God, it'd be a wonderful thing to see a concrete slab of that condition, but very rare to see these days. Self-leveling underlayments need to be greater than 3,000 PSI. There is another ASTM standard for that, F2873, uh, for cement-based self-leveling underlayments. It's worth having that document as well. Um, it's got to be flat, 3 sixteenths and 10. Again, uh, the self-leveling compounds are ideal for making things smooth and flat. Now keep in mind that a skim coat, which we all love and, and enjoy, does a great job of making things smooth but they don't necessarily make things flat. Self-leveling compounds are the flat providers. They make everything level, super flat, and don't conform to the shape of the subfloor. So something to keep in mind. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop selling self-levelers and move on. Shift some underlayments, there's an ASTM standard for that as well. Minimum requirements are a little bit less for that, 2000. Again, this is kind of driven by a residential market. Uh, there are a lot of uh, gypsum-based underlayments out there that have got compression strengths in excess of 5,000 PSI that work beautifully for commercial environments. But keep in mind that they take longer to dry. And there is an ASTM test standard for that on how to measure the moisture content of a, a gypsum slab. Remember that gypsum cures by evaporation. It doesn't cure by chemical reaction. The water has to leave the system in order for it to work. Uh, the thicker the pour, the longer it's going to take to dry. And you certainly don't want to cap that moisture in the gypsum underlayment before it gets to its driest point because it'll wind up uh, disintegrating on you and you'll have a big bunch of problems on it. Um, wood underlayments typically, again, 11 30 seconds, three quarter inch thick. Exposed durability is that exterior exposure, sanded face dry, et cetera. Um, still that there, and there's some standards for that as well. Um, Engineer Wood Association form number E30W and L355 uh, has some standards for how to prepare plywood underlayment for resilient flooring. Anyway, again, temperature control, temperature control, temperature. Acclimate the LVT for a minimum of 48 hours at working temperatures prior to installation. I, I need to make sure you understand what working temperature means, and that is defined as normal operating temperatures in which the building is going to run. Uh, it doesn't mean to acclimate it at 90 degrees for 48 hours and install it at 90 degrees, knowing full well the floor is going to be used at 72 degrees. If the room is going to be used at 72, you need to install it at 72 and you need to keep it at 72. 
That's how you control movement of LVT. And uh, I realized that that is a big challenge and we'll do what we can to help you when it gets time to help you. But in a perfect world, it's really uh, the right thing to do. And besides, it's easier to install at 72 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees. It's a hot day. Who wants to work when it's hot and sweltering outside? Turn the air conditioning on and enjoy it. Temperature control. Again, it's very important to understand where that LVT is going to be used. You're in this condo looking out over uh, where we're looking at is it's, uh, Miami, for example. Uh, you've got a lot of direct sunlight coming in that is just all oodles of UV radiation that are going to hit that dark colored floor. And you can see temperature changes in that flooring that are pretty spectacular. Um, I've seen temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And actually, you walk on them with your bare feet and you're going to notice things are hot. Um, that is going to be a challenge for most adhesive systems when you're installing into this kind of environment, particularly pressure sensitive stuff, which is essentially a thermoplastic adhesive, like a hot milk glue stick, for example, under a different kind of a genre, but give you the idea I'm talking about. And as you add heat to that hot milk glue stick, what's it do? It gets softer, it melts, and you can extrude it. You can with a little bit of effort, squeeze it through the gun and it comes out as a liquid material. But as soon as it cools down, it stiffens back up again. Uh, the same thing is true for a lot of these PSAs. They're thermal plastic materials. They will, uh, they will change their toughness, their strength with increases in temperature. They'll get stronger at colder temperatures. But if you are putting stresses on stuff at high temperatures, uh, things are going to move. So you've got to make sure about that. And if you're dealing with this kind of an installation, you've got to select the right kind of adhesive for that. We'll get into that in a minute. And again, maintenance of LVT flooring. Uh, it's a beautiful product. It looks fantastic. It's relatively easy to clean. I think one of the reasons why the uh, consumer market is going crazy about LVT is because it is one easy to install. You can almost do it yourself. Uh, it's easy to clean. Nothing stains it. It doesn't get uh, dirty that e easily, so you can manage to clean it up, sweep it, vacuum it, easy maintenance. If you do need to wash it, uh, use neutral cleaning solutions only and do not pour a cleaning solution directly on the flooring and certainly stay away from acidic or alkaline cleaners because those will, as I mentioned before, have some detrimental impact on performance of the flooring. You can polish them to a certain extent with low speed burnishing machines with a non-abrasive pad, low speed, but do not use high speed stuff. Uh, high speed puts an awful lot of heat in the system. And you'll wind up warming the product up and that's not a good thing to happen. It will have some impact on the, the surface wear layer. You'll change its shape and so on and so forth. But certainly if you can and do install some walk off mats, uh, before the doors to make sure your shoes are not bringing in uh, dirt and debris that can cause some abrasion on the surface of it. Okay. All right. So uh, the next couple slides I'm going to blaze through because there are an awful lot of stuff to go through there. But what are uh, MAPI's adhesive recommendations for bonding this luxury vinyl tile and plank? And uh, we'll kind of go through them briefly and then we'll get to a table and talk about points of differentiation. Okay, we start with some old school installation. This is Eco 300. This was uh, been around with us for, for many, many years. It's a solid vinyl and rubber flooring adhesive designed to be installed uh, as a wet set material. It's hard setting material. It's a, uh, if you listen to any of my other classes on uh, adhesive design, this is based on an acrylic polymer that has a very high glass transition temperature very high TCG, and that means that it's going to be a very rigid, hard, glass-like material when it's cured up. So uh, and we'll talk about why that's important uh, when we get to that table in a minute, uh, but it is uh, a little bit old school, requires um, a very dry concrete slab or motion mitigation system with a self-leveling of the limit in order to really function. It's uh, not current technology. Eco 811 
um, is something that we use to install resilient flooring as well. Even though this is a carpet tile glue, uh, it has got some acrylic uh, aggressive uh, performance for LVT as well. Uh, something to think about. We also use this for bonding fiberglass reinforced sheet vinyl uh, in areas where that was supposed to be done as a loose lace system, but no one likes walking on drum heads. So we allow it uh, to help lock that down at the subfloor. Eco 350 is a product we've had again for many years of MAP with a very strong success ratio. Again, uh, can be used as a, a wet set and a somewhat of a transitional. He's a little bit of a pressure sensitive range, but a limited working time window. Uh, again, old school technology, not necessarily the same kind of moisture resistance as some of the things we have going on for us today. Eco 360 been around since. I don't know, 2010, 11, 12, it's been around for quite a while. This was our premium uh, performance uh, transitional uh, phase changing adhesive system that started off its life as a pressure sensitive adhesive and over time got tougher and tougher, the polymer cost length and you wound up getting a more tougher adhesive that gives you a better dimensional stability. We'll talk about uh, how that compares to some of the others. Uh, great product. Does a great job, works extremely well underneath uh, vinyl flooring in hospital environments. Um, downsides are it's got less than an hour and a half, maybe two hours worth of working time. So it creates a little bit of a challenge from the insulation perspective, but uh, that's where it goes. Eco 373, product we introduced maybe four or five years ago. Phenomenal adhesive for the insulation of LBT. The advantages here are a fast cure time. 12 hour working time and super aggressive uh, high performance bonding for LBT. So, again, it's a very strong, aggressive bond. Uh, Multifunctional product works for carpet tile, works for LBT, as well as all the different variations of those products involved. So, those are, are good. A new one we introduced uh, this year is Ultravine Eco 379. This, again, is a designed to be a pressure sensitive installation. Uh, applied with a roller. Uh, instead of being on your hands and knees, uh, dragging trowels across the floor, you can apply this with a quarter inch nap uh, microfiber roller, and uh, that allows you to cover a lot of area surface faster, uh, get a uniform coverage layer, uh, no more trowel ridge show through, a variety of different advantages to it. Um, that's something uh, that is generating some interest and excitement in the marketplace today. If you're unfamiliar with that one, please talk to your uh, MAPE sales rep about that as well for further detail. Very exciting product. Very thin, so it's not necessarily ideal for installing with a trowel. It is designed to, to be used as a as a, a roller applied system. One of the latest ones and one of our greater successes is Eco 399. This is, a, again, a high performance, heavy duty, pressure sensitive, full covering and ease of design with enhanced shear properties, enhanced durability, enhanced toughness, if you will, helping to control uh, gap movement or movement of LVT. Again, the stiffer you can make these things, um, the better chances you are going to have of holding the dimensional stability of a, of a vinyl plank in place. Um, but the tr challenges here are making something super sticky but super hard. You trade some trade offs are involved here, and this one uh, has a the trade off is in the working time. You only have about six hours worth of working time uh, where you would normally like 373 is 12 hours of working time, but perhaps not the same kind of dimensional stability control that 399 does. We have fast systems like Mapper Contact MRT. This is a very aggressive, pressure sensitive, moisture barrier, high moisture resistant system for instant functionality of, uh, of floor covering of all types. Uh, great successes we've had on this particular product as well. If you're not familiar with tape installations for resilient flooring, please talk to your sales rep and I'm sure you'll be more than happy to give you some more detail. But for now, I have to move on to the next ones. We have some reactive systems involved, uh, which are common to you, Ultrabond G19, Ultrabond G21. These are both epoxy modified polyurethane two component systems. These are the ultimate dimensional stability control type products that are out there because they are reactive. 
uh, the cross-link while the curing process, and they become what's called a thermoset adhesive bond, as opposed to thermoplastic. I've used this word before in, in previous in this presentation where I talk about pressure sensitive adhesives as being thermoplastic, that changes in heat can cause them to get softer or harder. If it's heat, if it gets hotter, it gets softer, if it gets colder, it gets tougher. Uh, with thermoplastic, thermoset adhesives like G19 and G21, they are essentially unaffected by changes in temperature. They are what they are, no matter what temperature it is, and they are very tough. Um, and we'll talk about some performance attributes of them when I get to this chart in a minute. But uh, if you are looking for the ultimate in gap control, um, not that this is the answer that you want to have, folks, but a reactive system is a perfect solution for that. One of the reactive adhesives we have in the box is called OpenCon Eco MS for LBT. This is a modified silane polyurethane adhesive um, that uh, is designed uh, to be uh, one component moisture curing material, kind of like some of our wood adhesives that react with moisture in the slab, moisture in the plywood, moisture in the air. And once the moisture reacts with them, they become a thermoset rubber. Very durable, very high performance. And again, the bond strengths generated here are typically in excess of uh, the floor covering itself or even the underlay. So that's kind of the family of stuff we have for bonding uh, LVT. So how do you decide which one is what you want to get into and why would you want to do that? Uh, so the points of differentiation between all of these are it's chemistry type. Uh, we talked about water-based stuff. We talked about pressure sensitive tape stuff. We talked about reactive stuff. So there's three types of chemistries involved, but there are also insulation method changes. Some of them are wet lay materials. Some of them are pressure sensitive. Um, some of them have different working times and open times. I mentioned the difference between 373 and 399 in terms of its working time. Uh, the overall adhesive performance and moisture resistance. All these things are levers, if you will, switches that you can flip based on the installation conditions that you're faced with uh, going forward. So if you take a look at all of this, if you look at some of the uh, performance attributes of our products, and again, I'll preface this by sharing with you, these are internal test data um, done by our labs to give you some general idea of how these things work. Um, they were all typically done with the same kind of vinyl flooring, but we and the same substrate, which was cement based on substrate, but we have provided you some details here of how well they work. Eco 300, that old school wet lay hard set acrylic will give you three pounds of peel, and that's where you're trying to pull something straight off the floor, like a 90 degree angle off the floor. Um, 3.2 is not an awful lot, but flooring is not supposed to be pulled off the floor, frankly. If it's going to do anything, it's going to go sideways, but pulling it off the floor, it really is an indication of how brittle this adhesive is. And that could essentially be a, an issue with the underlayment breaking or whatever, but the shear values is important. That's uh, 77 to 80 PSI. So this is probably one of the largest numbers we have for shear strength and will give you, you know, the old, one of the best performances you can out of uh, controlling movement by getting something that's a high shear strength material. Um, but again, the moisture limits on that are five pounds moisture vapor emission rate and 80% emissions uh, for RH. It is a wet lay installation only. There is no pressure sensitive phase to it. And there's some working time, excuse flash time is zero minutes and working time is roughly 30 minutes. I can't quite see where that is, but it is 350. Another good product, uh, again, old school technology, good peel, uh, good shear numbers, a PSA installation method, but a limited moisture vapor emission rate of five pounds and 80%. And these are legitimate numbers. You don't want to use 350 on anything that's hotter than those, those numbers. Um, just wasn't designed for those kind of attributes when it came out 20 years ago. So it's something to keep in mind. 360, same kind of story. Again, a transitional phase changing, if you want to call it material with reasonable peel strength and very good shear strength. Uh, this one goes in ideally as a semi-wet installation method, so it requires porosity. But again, it's a limited moisture vapor emission rate deal. 
373, our great product we use for LVT, um, got great peel, which is indicative of a very sticky product. Uh, 20 pounds of moisture, uh, 20 pounds of shear strength is more than adequate to keep LVT in place as long as you've got the temperature control in order. Um, and obviously it is less in terms of shear strength than uh, one of our wet set materials, but it's still a great product for what it does. Uh, 379, a new one that we've got, again, great aggressive grab is a 10 pound number, 21 to 25 pounds on the shear strength. So again, good for shear and so on. 399, our product that we promote as a gap controlling, again, it's got great peel, a little bit less than some of the other super sticky ones, which kind of makes sense. The tougher you are, uh, the more brittle you can get, uh, that number changes. Um, but the shear values get to be much higher. The 811 is the same thing. MRT, big numbers as well, uh, more than adequate uh, peel strength and shear strength as well. But when we look at those reactive systems, uh, 16 pounds of, of peel for, for, MS, for LVT, G19, G21, all big numbers. Uh, and then the shear values, they simply just don't move. Um, the flooring will break before you do it. But again, it's a wet lay installation method. Moisture values are much higher, uh, a limited amount of working time. Now, I realize for those contractors who are on the phone, uh, on the webinar, you're saying, you try to force me to go to a wet lay installation method, my efficiencies are gonna drop. And I'm, I'm wishing I could figure out a way to improve that situation for you, but I, it's just going to be a difficult thing to do if you're trying to get a gap-free installation method. Uh, the things that, you want to, to keep it doing your pressure sensitive as far as I'm concerned is you can guarantee that the temperature remains constant before, during, and after the installation, and then everything's gonna be fine. If you can't guarantee that, then we need to look at some different methods, okay? A little bit about the installation technique and the differences associated with that. Again, a pressure sensitive method. This is the method by which the adhesive is spread on the floor and allowed to dry to completion. Uh, there's no water left in the system. The lines are all gone clear. Um, and then it becomes very sticky, rubbery ridges. And uh, the bond strength of this becomes greater the more pressure you apply. Again, this is something that in a pressure sensitive install, you really can open it up to traffic immediately after installation because that's just going to help improve the bond. The more you roll it, the more you step on it, the more you run stuff over it the better that bond strength is gonna be because you're pushing stuff into that uh, thermoplastic bridge and forcing it to a better contact point and therefore increasing the bond strength. You can you know, you know this by yourself. If you put a piece of uh, flooring on a pressure sensitive piece and lightly place it, you can get your fingernail under it and pull it back out if you have to replace it. But once you run your hand across it and put some pressure on it, then try to pull it back up again, that's not so easy to get that back off the floor. Guaranteed how that works. But the stronger it gets, the better it goes. So bond strength improves for traffic. So the more traffic you get, the more weight you apply it, the more you're pressing that flooring into the rubbery ridges, and thereby improving the contact. Um, so there is another kind of a quasi pressure sensitive movement out there that's called the semi-wet method. And this also helps improve uh, some bond strength. This might be the solution for uh, many of the contractors. You can still do a somewhat of a pressure sensitive mode, but you have to make sure that you're installing into adhesive that still has white areas in the ridges. It's kind of like you're making sausages of glue on the floor. You get the outside will flash over, uh, no longer transfers to the touch, but they're still white in the lines, which indicates there's still water in the system so when you apply the floor covering and roll it those ridges will rupture uh, and squeeze out new wet glue and the wet glue will improve on the contact points of the uh, of the adhesive and that's going to improve the bond strength so again i'm not really changing the performance but let's say i did 399 as a pressure sensitive insulation i think the number was 44 pounds linear inch of of peel as a pressure sensitive. If I did it as a wet lay, the same adhesive can get me higher numbers. I don't have them in front of me, 60, 70 maybe. Uh, it will increase the shear strength of the adhesive simply because I'm getting better contact. 
uh, and that's uh, an important aspect of these things working. Now, a wet lay, which everybody shreds and dreads uh, about using it, is the process where the adhesive is traveled on the floor and immediately installed. The flooring is immediately installed after it. And once that happens, when you hit it with a 100-pound roller, you mash the adhesive down into a complete monolithic layer, and you've got 100% transfer to the back of the flooring, 100% transfer to the back of the substrate, and this is where you get the maximum amount of bonding sites, attachment points again. Uh, these products uh, in a wet lay method, particularly for water-based pressure sensitive adhesives, are gonna give you the best performance in terms of shear strength, but again, Remember, they're thermoplastic adhesives. As long as you keep the temperature change under control, this is going to give you uh, really good performance aspects. Okay. The key factor here that you must remember is that the substrate must be porous in order for this to work. Uh, if the substrate is not porous, which a lot of PSAs can be used on, in many cases are uh, pressure sensitive adhesives can be used to directly installed on top of an epoxy moisture barrier, for example. That is not going to be the case uh, for a wet lay installation. You must have somewhere for the water in the adhesive to evaporate, move into, be absorbed, a blotter layer, if you will. Uh, so the concrete slab must be uh, porous. And again, the limitations of water-based wet set adhesive porosity is a mandatory thing. If you there is an ASTM F3191 test method for determining a porosity of uh, a concrete slab, you must do this in order to determine whether the water drops are going to go into the slab or not. <clears throat> if they look like what you see on the right, then water is not going in concrete at all. This is not something you can use a wet set on. You've got to remediate the situation one way or another. Uh, what's going on here? It could be the presence of a water repellent, uh, silicate treatments that prevent water from getting into the concrete slab at all. <clears throat> or perhaps a high fly ash concentration as well, can have some impact on how that water absorbs again. If you need to work a wet lay or semi-wet lay installation and you're dealing with a non-porous substrate, that's when you need to throw the red flags up and say, stop, I need to do something to fix that. Reactive adhesives, on the other hand, don't necessarily care uh, whether the floor is porous or not. Um, but they do care about the temperature. The lower the temperature, the slower they're going to cure, the hotter the temperature, the faster they're going to cure. But again, that's a limited, um, that's a very small limitation for these reactive adhesives and all, so on and so forth. So as we kind of wrap this thing up again, um, you're going to start seeing a lot more information coming out from manufacturers of adhesives and floor covering and so on and so forth regarding the temperature control of uh, for the installation of their resilient products. Um, this is an example over here on the right where they say the HVAC should be fully operational and set at minimum operating temperatures for a week prior to the application of this material. Uh, you, and if you don't have it in place, you need to move it in. You need to rent an air conditioning unit to get the place set up at 72 at the operating temperature. Again, every manufacturer is telling you we've heard your complaints about gapping. Uh, we heard your complaints about the performance of our product, but we kept coming back to tell you that the only way to solve this problem is control the temperature and use high shear strength, high modulus adhesives and install them in uh, semi-wet or wet lay type installation. So we're prepared to help you with that. Uh, we have a lot of, all of our adhesives can be used as wet lay materials or semi-wet lay materials as well as long as you follow those limitations on porosity. In summary, and again, I'm, I'm running to the end of my hour here again, we need to keep in mind that luxury vinyl tile plank is an engineered material, it's a plastic, and as such, um, will change its dimensional shape based on temperature. And if you're really trying to control the gapping, you need to work with the building owners, the general contractors, facility maintenance people to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of the installation. I'm sorry, it just sounds simple and not necessarily the easiest thing to do, I understand. But it's it's a must have 
for LVT to keep it from capping. Using wet lay or semi-wet lay adhesive methods will increase the shear strength and tensile strength of materials and help reduce that again. Water-based pressure sensitive adhesives that can be used as wet lay adhesives on porous substrates are great, but keep in mind that they are still, we consider them plastic and they will change with exposure to UV radiation uh, in quote unquote heat uh, and other forces will cause that to thing to change as well. They will help by, uh, by going into a semi-wet or wet lay installation to control the gap. Uh, and obviously, uh, since we're in the subfloor preparation world as well, making sure that floor is smooth and flat uh, is perfect uh, for helping create that perfect visual gap-free installation method. Okay. So having said all that, I look at the end of my presentation and I will open it up the floor for any questions that might have. Jen, back to you. Oh. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, and like you said, we are at the end of the hour. Um, I think that probably the best thing to do would be, uh, since there aren't any questions that have popped in just yet, um, what we can do is end it here. And I know that uh, we always get questions after the fact, because I know that everybody's probably like me, thinking of questions after we say goodbye. So, um, if you if some questions don't come in as I'm saying goodbye here, we can have everybody send any questions that do come up to uh, Mape Digital at mape.com, and we'll make sure that the questions get to you. And um, I want to thank you for an excellent as usual presentation, and we want to thank everybody for their time today because uh, we know that your time is very valuable and the fact that you've taken some time out of your day to spend with us it means an awful lot to us uh, so thank you and uh, thanks again Jeff My and, pleasure. like I said uh, please if you think of questions send them to Mape digital at mapay.com and we'll get them to Jeff and uh, this will conclude today's uh, webinar and we'll see you on the next one Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.